you so much, Bante. Uh, we have actually quite a bit of questions. Um, so I'll just start off with, um, to be fair, there have been many questions submitted even before the session itself. And then we have a few live questions here. So to be fair to those who have already submitted, I'd like to give priority to those questions first. Um, so Bante, just now you actually mentioned that at SBS, uh, you do not provide temporary ordination. But on the other hand, for people who are keen to so-called experiment and see whether they might be suited for a monastic life, they could actually join the community for a brief period. What is that brief period at SBS that mm -hmm. would be conducive for them to fully uh, realize whether they are up to it or not? Yeah, I think I didn't say brief period. Maybe well, some imagine sorry. it has to be a brief period. Uh, because the period may be brief indeed, or it could be longer. And the duration is basically determined by however long it takes basically for a person to get a good picture whether monk's life is really something he would like to yeah. undertake or not. And for some people, uh, it just clicks straight away and they feel, yeah, that's really my thing. And they know it. Uh, for others, you know, there could be some things you like, some things that are, you're not sure, can I handle with this? There's the monk's rules, uh, there's the training, I cannot travel wherever I want, maybe I can't get the food that I want all the time. So there could be some uncertainties for a while. And that could take a couple of months or maybe even half a year. I remember there was one candidate here in 2020. Uh, he was also, he was very interested but also wasn't sure uh, he can do it. So I said to him, you know, you just stay here, you practice with us. You don't have to make a decision. There will come a time where you have enough data, where you really know, yes, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. What will you know? No, actually, it's not what I want. It's much better to wait until that moment comes rather than pushing it and then finding out, no, actually not, or or running away too early without having enough information. So actually we don't have a time limit. Right. So whatever time it takes, as long as you're still contemplating, uh, that's okay. Once you've made up your mind, uh, then uh, you can see uh, if it's not your thing, then it would say, okay, yeah, it may be also good, you can move on or go to the retreat center so that other people can also come and experience the practice. Right. So yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So does this mean that um, the individual need to renounce his assets, you know, for example, selling off the car, selling off the house, um, closing down your bank accounts and stuff like that, even though they're just trying it out for a period of time? No, no, no. Okay. So they're still uh, wearing white clothes. They're not yet ordained. That's why I say we don't do temporary ordinations. So you're still wearing white clothes and you're just practicing with the Sangha. You join right. our activities, but okay. uh, you hold on to your assets and don't relinquish everything first because you might not know, you might need it pretty soon. Who knows? So, yeah, no, I, I would not encourage that. Even though some people are very enthusiastic and, uh, but then, you know, it's always good to let things settle for a bit until the honeymoon period is over and then see whether it feels still okay also after a couple of months. Right. If it does, great. And then that's the time where you can transition and make a more formal commitment and say, yes, I've made up my mind. I want to become a monk. I want to ordain an SPS, Monk Training Center. And then you can request to become a postulant. A postulant is somebody who is already determined. Okay, he knows what he wants. That's the time before becoming a postulant only, where money has to be settled, uh, you need your parents' permission, and, and the other things. So at that time only, these things have to be taken care of. Before that, uh, come and see. Ehi basiko. Right, come and experience. Um, and is there like a language proficiency requirement? So does the person need to be uh, proficient a little bit in English or? Uh, I would say yes, uh, okay. especially in English, okay. uh, because of my own language deficiency in other languages, because I don't speak much Chinese or Hokkien. So in order to really fully partake of our training here, to understand the announcements, 
it is quite important that a person has a kind of solid basis in English language. Right. Not to the level of writing essays and papers, but that you can understand Dhamma conversations, that when you have a Sutta discussion, you can follow along. Uh, that is kind of important, yes. All right. And is it possible, so while the time is uh, not defined, is it possible for the person to perhaps try it out for, let's say, a year and then sort of go back to regular life and then come back again and try it out for another few years? Is that something that is available to the person? You mean as a layperson, right? He tries out yes. as a layperson yeah, for a year, yeah. you know, staying yeah. with the Sangha, uh, cannot make a decision or maybe at that time it's not quite right, not the right so time some yet. commitment in the lay life, so they... Yes, they, yes. Yes. Possible. Then go back and then come come afterwards. Yeah, we had people do exactly that. Actually, the candidate that I said earlier, uh, who took almost a year. Yeah, he took actually a year to wait. Uh, then he went back to France, um, went to his parents, then explained to them what he plans to do, and then came back a second time. I think another three or four months later. So yes, yeah, exactly. That can be done. Absolutely no problem. Okay, they yeah. won't get blacklisted. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so I just want to go back to the video, which was whether the, um, you know, whether the uh, Sangha is corrupting or, or actually protecting the Sasana. So we have actually questions in relation to the Pati Moka itself. Like, um, so I'm just going to like integrate them together, which is like, what are the benefits of upholding the Pati Moka? How is the Pati Moka actually helping to prolong the Buddha Sasana. So I, I would say it sort of relates to the uh, video itself. Mm -hmm. Now the Patimokha is the equivalent to what was what you have as a layperson with your five precepts. The Patimokha is the monk's version of the precepts. The only difference is it's not five, it's not ten, it's not twenty, it's two hundred and twenty seven, which are refinements, you can say, of, of the five to eight precepts, but then more refined in areas where are typical for monastics and where also there is a higher level expected for monastics when it comes to conduct, uh, both about food, uh, towards women, where you want to be more on a cautious side. Like for example, for a layperson, you don't have a rule uh, not to be alone with another person of the opposite gender of the opposite sex. But then for monastics, monks as well as nuns, we do have rules to avoid uh, being alone in a private, secluded place where nobody can see or hear what's going on. This is both for our own protection, that uh, no sense of intimacy or maybe flirtiousness comes up, but also of the, for the protection of the, of the lady or of the, of the young man who is in the company of the nun. So it actually it's helpful for both sides. And so there are extra layers of safety and security that the rules in the Patimokha uh, enshrine. And in this way, uh, they will propagate and make the sasana more long lasting. Mm. Because you don't get into trouble with yeah. things that can be foreseen would be not quite right to do. But if you have only the five precepts, the boundaries are very uh, wide and broad and not very tight, so you might sometimes get into a diff difficult area, which you could avoid if you follow the monk's rules or the rules for the nuns. Mm -hmm. It's like if you drive with a bicycle or with a small car. Uh, at that time, of course, you need an engine, but you also need brakes, right? Because sometimes you go too fast, it's good you have brakes there. But, okay. But then if you go with a race car, with a Formula One race car, it, you also need brakes, but your brakes need to be much better, much stronger. It's not enough to put in the same brakes you use in your bicycle. That won't be able to stop you. So monastic life is much more dedicated towards the goal, committed, but also you need a better framework, stronger brake system also. And the veneer is sub something like that, like the boundaries over which you should not go. And within those boundaries, actually it simplifies your life a lot and makes it very easy to dedicate yourself to the Dhamma, to meditation, and to the practice. 
Right. Yeah. No grey areas, so to speak. Uh, I mean, within the rules, there are grey areas where sometimes you might not fully understand how a certain rule is to be interpreted. You might have to consult yourself as a senior monk or as an experienced teacher. Uh, so yes, there can be grey areas there, but grey area would be something where you don't know what is the right interpretation. But once you know, uh, then you should commit yourself to it, you know. Not grey in the sense you understand the rule, but you don't want to follow it. That sense, that attitude, uh, I would normally not recommend for monks because what the Buddha often speaks is about hiri ottapa, shame and fear of wrongdoing. And in the context of monastics, he even says, anumatesu vachesu bhayadasavi, seeing danger even in the slightest thought, one trains oneself in the training rules. So it's an attitude of not taking it easy, ah, this is just a small rule, who cares? No, they are actually all good reminders for mindfulness, for conscientiousness, and we take them on board fully. Uh, still with a light heart, with compassion, with softness, but also not making concessions by throwing, throwing out the child with the bathwater. Since the rules come directly from the Buddha, and they were good enough for all of the many generations of monks and nuns in the past, then probably they are good enough for me. Right? So that's our attitude. Right. Um, have there ever been discussions about whether the Patimoka rule, like you said, it has worked for so many generations, so many thousands of years, but has there ever been discussion that perhaps it needs to be updated to take into consideration the latest development, whether it is in society or whether it's in relation to technology being made more available. For example, um, Bante, you had mentioned earlier on that access to library, access to some digital kind of uh, gadgets would be useful in the propagation of the Dhamma. Uh, obviously, during the Buddhist time, such things were not available. Uh, I mean, we are talking about digital technology. Here. So uh, should, should the rules be so-called reviewed to take into consideration some of the more recent developments in society as well as uh, in, 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 in terms of technology. So yes, you're bringing up an important point about how to deal with the modern society and yeah. both the opportunities it brings, but also the dangers that come from it. And how do we navigate that area skillfully? Yeah. And different monasteries, different traditions have come up with their own uh, guidelines, recommendations, or house rules, you can say, about what they regard as allowable, acceptable, and where they say, no, here we draw the line, this is what we don't want to do. So we would not necessarily uh, we change the party mocker, the rules that the Buddha himself has laid down, but you can always voluntarily uh, practice or agree in a community on a standard that goes beyond that, where, for example, here in SBS, we recognize, yes, there is benefit of internet use even. Uh, you can do some online research for certain things. Uh, but there are also dangers if you spend a lot of time on Facebook, YouTube, yeah. uh, WhatsApp, email all the time. Uh, you would, at best, maybe just waste a lot of time or also get into areas that are completely unrelated to our monk's life. Therefore, we actually have a limitation of online time here in SBS. It's a little bit like an internet cafe. You have an internet ticket, which you can use for 45 minutes, and then it cuts off your internet. So, so you have a weekly quota uh, where you can log in, uh, you can do, if you have wanted to check your emails, it's okay, but you cannot spend the whole day online uh, just browsing and surfing away. So this way we navigate a little bit. Yes, we want, also monks to be skillful and also learn how to skillfully make use of them rather than just completely throwing them out. It's actually much better to learn a skillful relationship with technology, yeah. uh, but then also without getting sucked in uh, too far. So in this way, monasteries and traditions have made and come up with their own guidelines and standards how to navigate that area. Right. So, so, so obviously different monasteries are 
adopting their own approach in relation to to you know like living with uh, technology and stuff like that. But how then do we ensure that there is consistency across? Um, with those uh, areas, there will be no consistency because they are not based on the Buddha himself. So different teachers or traditions will have their own standards where they draw the line. And this is where individual differences can and maybe even should be to some degree where what works in one environment may not work in another one. What works for me is may not work for formulations. So it is good actually that we have an area where we can adapt and ideally it's not just a teacher alone who sets all the rules. How we do it here in SBS is I will invite the Sangha to discuss a topic together and then we have, can have a debate on that. And then at the end often we have a vote where people say, okay, who wants, wants it like that? Who wants it like this? Who doesn't mind it either way? And in this way, we come up with a system that works for the majority or ideally for everyone, but at least for the last, large majority of monastics. And other traditions or other places might come to a different conclusion. And if it works for them, that's also great. Okay, right. I would like um, to move on from the Batimoka rules, uh, if, if there are any other questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, let me just try to... Um, so there are quite a bit of questions in terms of um, challenges, challenges that monks might face while undergoing monastic training. Um, and some even ask very specifically, Bante yourself, when you first ordain and become a monk, what were some of the challenges that you encountered uh, transitioning into a monastic life? And how then uh, were these challenges overcome? So one is general and one specific to Bante, mm. your own experience. Yeah. Let me start with my own experience, right. because it kind of relates to the other one. Yes. Now, I, my main challenge was the lack of monastic training was that the tradition where I ordained did not have a formal system for training monks in all these different areas that I have outlined just earlier. Right. Mainly it is a meditation center where we would get good, solid meditation instructions. Yes, great. Uh, but there's much more to monks life than just this alone. And my challenge was often about finding somebody or having access to someone who can help me in areas that are not explicitly just meditation. And that was, I find, a bit lacking in those in that tradition. And this is probably one of the main reasons why I thought to myself at some point, hmm, if at a later point uh, I, I am asked or I'm given the opportunity to contribute, I will make sure that monks will get proper training so they don't have to suffer the same thing that I had to suffer of not uh, having guidance in other areas that are also equally important. Uh, practical skills, uh, chanting, uh, meditation, of course, is important. Tamma, Vinaya. So there's so many areas. So this was my challenge uh, often. Even though I didn't have really, I didn't have strong, uh, how to say, obstacles directly with monk's life itself. Somehow it felt quite natural to me and I didn't have any major phases where it never contemplated really about going back to a lay life or something. But it can come up, I have seen many monastics where at some point in their monastic life uh, there can also come up doubts. And then it is good that we have Kalyana Mittas to whom we can go and have a conversation and learn and Hear, hear from them, from their experience, how have they uh, dealt with similar situations. That's the benefit of having a support system. You're not alone. Whereas before I became a monk, I always felt, yeah, I have to do my own practice, but if I don't do it, also nobody cares, and I wouldn't know to whom to go to clarify any of those details. So whereas in a monastic community, suddenly you have access to both people in your own community, but also actually you can go to any of these other monasteries, any famous teacher, and you you will get a chance to speak the same probably, or even spend the time in, in this monastery, or get close-up contact, which is quite difficult to get 
in most cases for, for lay people. So, so many benefits of having access, not just to the infrastructure, but also to the software of other monastics, Kalyana meters, teachers, guides who can help us. I'm, I'm just curious also, um, when, when a monk sort of like go to another monastery, which is of a different tradition, does this mean that they need to reordain under that tradition or they, they don't have to? Normally not, no. Okay. Because your ordination is valid uh, wherever you go. Right. Now, in some very few monasteries, they, they are not sure whether if somebody walks in and you don't know the place from which monastery he comes, from which tradition, and, or maybe you, you do know and you know their standards of ordination, how they conduct the ordination, their standards are kind of very loose and there could be a problem with the legal validity of that ordination. Then they might ask the monk to reordain in their own tradition and start over uh, anew. But normally you should not do that. I mean, it's not very polite to ask somebody to reordain unless you have a really good reason, a uh, really strong suspicion that there's something wrong. So by default, we give the benefit of the doubt. And if it turns out, yes, there's something wrong with his ordination, yes, then he would have to reordain. But by default, uh, we accept each other's ordinations. Right. And, and is that specific to the Theravada tradition only? Or we basically we will welcome even those under Mahayana tradition or the Tibetan tradition? Mahayanas in Tibetan tradition, they can, like in SPS, we have a monk training center, but we also have a retreat center. So if they want to practice in SPS, make use of our facilities, uh, then the retreat center would actually be the ideal place for them. Uh, as to the monk training center, it is geared particularly to Theravada monastics. Uh, one reason is because you were asking already about the ordination. Outside of the Theravada tradition, they use also different Vinaya. The Mahayanas come from a different Vinaya tradition and they use a different language for ordination different standards of how the ordination is conducted, how the legal uh, boundary, the SEMA, has been established, that from a Theravada perspective, might invalidate a person's ordination from our own lineage perspective. Now, within their lineage, it's, it's okay, but yeah. within the Theravada lineage, there could be some concerns. Just to give you an example, earlier I mentioned that we cannot ordain more than three people at, at a time. Now, this is a principle that is found in our Theravada texts, Bali texts, Vinaya texts. But outside the uh, Theravada tradition, it's not uncommon that they would ordain 30, 50 people in a large ceremony. And that would, from a strict Vinaya perspective, not be a valid ordination. So for these kind of reasons, when we know about the tradition, then we, uh, in such a case, a person can still visit Spend, this, spend some time with us, uh, but we, we would not do, for example, the party mocha together, something like that. Okay. So, but within the Theravada tradition, at least here in SPS, uh, we accept each other's ordinations uh, normally. Yes. Okay. All right. um, okay. We, we move on to another one, which again uh, could be very specific to Bante, your, your own experience. What are some of the uplifting moments that Bante had experienced as a monastic over the years, starting as a new monk, all the way now to being a trainer of monks? To me, actually, the first time when I, after, soon after my ordination, when I had the opportunity to join the party mocha, the recitation of the rules for the monks and nuns, and the monastery where I ordained in Baalk in Burma, um, we had a huge Sangha, a huge community. And I felt so, so joyful being together with all these monks, which I were thinking for so long time. And it felt to me really like coming home, like joining uh, my family. Now, I still love and care for my normal family also, but I felt immediately very much at home in the, in the Sangha. And that I still remember as one of the very uh, uplifting moments in my early years as a monk. Right. And then, as I said earlier, also the opportunity to meet other monastics and 
have Dhamma conversations with them, sometimes very long, sometimes all night, and talk about practice. It's something I, I really love to do. And then nowadays, where I see people coming and joining our place here, uh, or also other places, where I see them coming in first as lay, laymen, um, look, this is a little bit like a jewel or like a, like a diamond. But a diamond still has very rough edges. And so you see them come in, and then they start to practice, they join, and they undertake the training. Eventually they ordain. And then some time goes by. And often in the past also, I stayed for a certain time in a monastery, then I would move on to another place. And then I meet somebody again whom I've met maybe four or five years earlier, who ordained at that, at that place. And now I meet him again. And then I see, I can see so clearly how much development has happened, how this became a beautiful, well-rounded uh, person in his Dhamma understanding, Dhamma practice, also in his conduct and deportment, and where you can see the Dhamma is still working. The Buddha's teachings that are so old, they are still functioning. And sometimes with yourself, you know, if you look back your own progress, you don't see it so easily because, mm. well, you're always there. Yeah. So, how much did you progress from last week to this week, or to two weeks ago? Well, it's very hard to see sometimes. But if you don't see somebody for a long time, and suddenly you meet that person again, you can see what has happened in between. And that also I find very inspiring and uplifting. It's like a living testimony of the, of the power of the Dharma and the transformative power of the Dhamma, who makes these beautiful human beings out of them, who fulfill their human potential. So that is really one of the joys that I personally get also of working with newcomers, working with ordination candidates or newly ordained monks, where then I can contribute a little bit in helping them to grow and flourish in the Dhamma. Yeah, these are the joys of, of a Buddhist monk. Right. Um, just curious, um, so on the other hand, what are some of the more challenging experiences, Bhante, you have encountered in training monks or new monks? Mm. Here we are quite fortunate that even though I'm officially the monk trainer, but it's actually not a one man show or a one person job in that other Sangha members will also help. So even sometimes I see a person is doing something not quite right, uh, but somebody else can also see it. And I don't have to talk with everyone about everything. So some other monks can also uh, provide feedback and give some guidance. And what I find or found more challenging is where at times when I came fresh to SBS and when it was more or less on my own at first, and I didn't have other monks here, so I had to establish that system a little bit. Now, of course, we had monks here also before I came, uh, but then at that time, the community was smaller, so there was not a large Sangha who could support uh, what we are doing. So I had kind of to start and establish a new system on my own. And at that time, yeah, everything that had to be put in place, all these cornerstones, I had to think them through. Uh, yes, there was another monk to discuss with, uh, but uh, much more responsibility, both on my own shoulders, and then also I had to be much more involved in all the nitty gritty. Uh, but nowadays, that is actually much easier, where uh, we can also build on the experience of earlier generations and also the support of other monks. So, for example, when a person finds it difficult to adjust to certain linear rules, uh, where they think, oh, it's just so small rules, why do we have to follow that? It's helpful if, if it's not just me saying that alone, but also others see it in, in the same way. Then the person doesn't feel as if it's just uh, he's doing something strange or only I want him to do something, but this is kind of our common standard or established way of doing things, and it makes it much easier. Right. So that area of kind of uh, telling people uh, 
maybe you can do it more like this, not do, do it like that. By my own nature, I don't enjoy that. It's not that I, I don't like looking for faults in others. I would just be happy just doing, minding my own business. So I had to learn that a little bit to get out of my shell and also sometimes uh, yeah, point things out when I think it is worthwhile uh, mentioning something. But, you know, it's also something you train and practice and over time you get better at it, feel more comfortable with it. And monk training does not enter, uh, does not end at five years, 10 years, 15 years. You can always learn more, develop more, and in this way progress in the Buddhist teachings. So here we have a question about what is the nature of relationship a monk can actually maintain with immediate family members, um, you know, after ordaining as a monk, and what is the frequency of interaction allowed? Yeah, this is one of the areas that again will be different from one community to another. Uh, the Vinaya rules, there's nothing mentioned of how often you can see your parents or how rarely. And this is also something that I think should develop in a natural manner, where different families will have different preferences also and different needs. Um, as a general guideline, I think it is good and important actually for the monk not to cut ties with his family. Or there are some who are so inspired, they think, no, I leave everything behind and don't want to contact anyone anymore. Uh, I think this is not quite right because even, even, in most cases it's not even the case, but even if you or if the monk feels he does not need a lot of contact, your mother might need it, <laughs> your father might need it. And if you don't need it and your practice is so good, good, great. But then if you can help another person to suffer less, you should do it. Now, it doesn't cost you a lot of effort to have occasionally maybe a telephone call or send a, send a message. And that makes a lot of difference, I think, for most parents that they still have the feeling they can be part of their son's path, also understand what he's doing and see, uh, have contact still from time to time. And I think it's quite important. And both actually, both for the parents and also for the monk, even if he sometimes doesn't believe it. And actually here in SPS, what we also sometimes do and encourage if parents want to see the monk or their son uh, uh, for a longer time, rather than the monk going back home and spending a week at home or two weeks, theoretically that would also be possible. But even better than that would be that we invite the parents to come, come to our place. We actually have a house you know, just at the edge of the forest, at the edge of the monastery, where parents can come and stay there and during daytime, uh, meet with the monk, have conversation, and also see the monk in his new environment, or see him in his natural habitat, you know, like a wild forest animal, you know, go to the jungle and see, see them in the natural habitat. So in this way also, much more understanding will also come from the parents, when they see their son in the context of how he's living now, also see that people actually do respect the monks quite a lot and treat us quite well, I have to say. And this is also something that often mothers will have concern. How is the food there? Things like that. So when they see actually there's a lot of support and there's appreciation for what we're doing, it helps them also to emotionally come to terms with that. And that's why I think it's often a good idea to invite them over either for just a, just a short visit, it can be a day trip, uh, or stay for a week. And, and they don't have to meditate all day or live like monks and nuns, so they can still stay together and can even go in the evening if they want to go for dinner out in the village and die being down, that's fine. And so, and, but they can still also be more than in contact with, with their son. So I think this is a pretty good arrangement and I usually encourage if a person, his parents are willing and able to drive and to visit, I think it's a nice way to bring them in and also show them 
uh, the monk in his natural environment. Thank you very much for these interesting questions and very relevant, I would say. And it was a truly enjoyable evening also for me uh, because it is a thing that is very dear to my heart, monk coordination, monastic training, and how can we have good monks who can also then be inspiring, uh, inspiring not just teachers and leaders, but also good practitioners for themselves. But then out of this practitioners, we will get, hopefully, also a whole generation of monks who are very capable in sharing the Dhamma, being inspiring, uh, giving guidance, and also give something back to our Malaysian society, to our Buddhist societies, and also, uh, more generally speaking, to anyone uh, that, he that he meets and encounters. So in that sense, I hope, hope that the efforts that we are undertaking here in SPS Monk Training Center will also be and are already a support to this asana and also for the flourishing and well-being of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, if you would like, we can also close the evening by undertaking the sharing of merits, where we can invite our departed relatives and friends to join in and rejoice in the merits that we have made. So you can close your eyes, you can close your eyes and mentally recollect some of the good deeds that we have done throughout the day. This can be smaller acts of kindness, giving a hand to someone, or cooking or preparing a meal for someone, of of some family members. Listening to the Dhamma. And we can mentally invite our departed relatives and friends to rejoice in all the merit that we have made. Let us do that by reciting together. So you can at home tune in in your living room and just be chant together. You can follow along. Itang me nyatinang hutu Sukita hong tu nya tayo. Idang lo nya tinang ho tu. Sukita hong tu nya tayo. Idang bo nya tinang ho tu. Sukita hong tu nya tayo. Etta vata cha am hi hi. Sampadang punya sampadang Sapi satta anumodandu Sapa sampati sithiya And lastly, let us also make an aspiration towards Nibbana so that the good karma that we have accumulated will also support us on the path to liberation. Please repeat after me. Idang me punyam Asavakaya Vang ho tu Idang me punyam Nipanasa Pachayo Ho tu Sandu Sandu Sandu